Ellen, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me well? Because I tell you right now, my ears are bursting when I speak here. But uh, thank you, Ellen, very much for that uh, introduction. I'd like to thank Joe for having me come down also. Uh, it's always good to see Joe. We work so closely together in terms of Presidential Library Foundation activities in our respective libraries. Kurt, it's good to see you after so many years and all and see that you're settled in the area here. I understand Kurt gave a similar talk a while back, about a week or two ago, so I hope I don't repeat anything and can add to, uh, to what uh, Kurt has stated. I see there are a lot of students here, I guess the G Great Decisions program. Uh, so I'm always delighted to see students. One thing Ellen didn't mention is in my previous incarnation, I had been a faculty member on the staff of Brooklyn College many, many years ago, more than I care to remember. And it's always a pleasure to come by and talk to students. Uh, tonight's topic is uh, Russia and the near abroad, um, kind of a vast topic. What I'd like to do, just to give you an idea, is to talk about Russia and its relationship with the near abroad, how Russia perceives it, doesn't perceive it, and how the near abroad may perceive uh, Russia. And then what I'd like to do is focus on Ukraine, the relationship with Ukraine, the Russian-Ukraine relationship, and what's going on in Ukraine right now, and what does that mean for the near abroad in general. We talk about the near abroad, Ellen defined it. She talked about Eastern Europe. I'm just focusing on, seeing on the 14 uh, independent republics that came out of the demise of the so with the Soviet Union, um, plus Russia, the 15th. Um, the near abroad, we hear Putin, we hear Medvedev, we hear the Russians talking about the influence that they should have, the interests that they have, um, the investments that they have in the near abroad. And there's always a consideration in the Western minds that the Russians want to take over the near abroad and maybe form another empire. We saw in the wake of the 2008 Georgia war that they, uh, there was fear that the Russians were moving in with force into the near abroad. And in the wake of the presidential election in Ukraine last month, there's concern in Ukraine as well as in, in the international arena that the Russians may be in a position where they will be reuniting or having a closer union and greater influence in Ukraine because of Yanukovych who won the election being very pro-Moscow, at least in the statements that we heard during the course of the campaign. I would like to posit tonight that it's probably a little bit more murky than that. It's not that clear cut. Like anything in life, nothing's totally black and nothing's totally white. It's kind of a shady area in between. Uh, I would say, first of all, you have to look at the Russian view themselves of the near abroad. There are three basic views that the Russians have of the near abroad, if you look at the history in the post-Soviet uh, world. Uh, there was what would, could be considered the reformist view that was in, uh, epitomized by Kozarov, the, prime minister, the foreign minister in the early 1990s, who kind of looked at uh, the near abroad as something that was passe, that the Soviet Union fell apart, it was necessary for the Russians to start moving toward the West, have greater relations with the West, opening up toward the West, getting integrated into the Western economic and political system. In other words, a more liberal point of view. So for Kozarov, the near abroad was not such a big uh, driving force in terms of Russian foreign policy. The other point of view from the Russian perspective would be what is considered kind of a centrist role. And I think Primakov, who was the prime minister in the late 90s, probably ex uh, epitomized this to a certain extent. For the centrist, they view the near abroad in historical and cultural uh, terms. There was a close history between Russia and those near abroad states. There was a cultural legacy because of the large uh, Russian ethnic populations that existed and continued to live in those, uh, in those states. And therefore, there was a feeling that, the, that Russia has to have some kind of relationship with the near abroad, a lot closer than people from the reformers point of view uh, had in mind. Then, of course, on the other extreme, there was the nationalist point of view by Zhirinovsky, who, uh, who uh, epitomized it to a certain extent, that Russia had lost these states and it was necessary for the Russian uh, great power status and for Russian history to go back and take these states over and have great influence on them and kind of meld them into a single whole once again, kind of a new empire. So you can see in the Russian political system, there's been a wide view of what the near abroad is and how to approach the near abroad. 
to a great extent. And just, you know, the other day I was reading, and I think I'm, you would have to get a little bit more information, but there was a legislation that's been introduced by the Russian government in the Duma, basically by the foreign ministry, trying to redefine who would be considered a compatriot of Russia. In other words, uh, in the wake of the demise of the Soviet Union, the Russians had viewed anyone that lived in those uh, former republics, uh, people uh, who had any kind of ethnic allegiance, any ethnic tie or, or ancestry, etc., to Russia as being part of the Russian Empire or compatriots of Russia. Now the move is to say people that have some kind of citizenship, maybe. In other words, people that have lived in Russia but moved out but have maintained some kind of citizenship with the Russian state or have some kind of cultural affinity of, with the Russian state will be considered compatriots. And this is going to kind of redefine the relationship. I'd have to see the law exactly how it was introduced. It's not actually a law, it's a bill that's been introduced since the Duma. So right now you can see the Russians are redefining what a compatriot may or may not be, what the relationship the Russia should have with the near abroad. I give you this as a background so that you can see that it is not as clear cut as a lot of people uh, in the West or observers outside of Russia looking upon the, the Russia's relationship with the near, near abroad like it to make it look like. Okay, if we take that as a background, what Russia does have a, a role and does have an interest in the near abroad, let's, let's make that clear. It is a spectrum of how much it is. But if you look at it, what are the interests that Russia has in the near abroad? What is it that motivates Russia? I would posit to you that there are four basic interests that Russia has. You students listen very carefully here. Uh, there's obviously the uh, security interest. There's an economic interest. I would say there's an identity interest. And then there's a regional power interest. What do I mean by all of those? First of all, in terms of security, Russia has always defined its security in terms of expanse, buffer, territory. Remember the Napoleonic Wars? The distance of the Russian Empire helped defeat the, uh, Napoleon's armies. So the Russians have always had a historical view of defense as being land-based and land mass. Even though this, we are in, this, in a world of intercontinental ballistic missiles, the Russians still have kind of that mental outlook on the history of defense. So that's, that's important to them, to have some kind of barrier between themselves and the outside world that they would see as enemies. Uh, the second security concern that the Russians have is obviously the conflicts that are taking place in a lot of the near abroad states. You see the conflicts between Armenia and Azerbaijan. You see the Islamic uh, uh, insurgency that's taking place in Central Asia, and I'll return to that a little later on. All of these have a concern for Russia that they don't want them to spill over into their own territories directly, and therefore the Russians need to maintain some kind of physical presence or influence in these states to minimize those conflicts from spreading into their own territory. And of course, then there's the biggest concern of all, which is NATO, the expansion of NATO going eastward. Uh, the Russians are obviously very concerned about this. Uh, you saw this with the Georgia War in 2008, I mentioned that earlier, where it was quite obvious that they undertook this step in order to prevent Georgia from moving toward NATO membership. As you recall in that year at the Bucharest Conference, there was a great effort to try to move Ukraine and uh, Georgia toward NATO membership. Uh, that was gonna fail anyway because of German and uh, French opposition but that's a whole different story at this stage of the game. Um, so NATO expansion is something that the Russians have feared in terms of their security. Um, we'll be returning to these things later. Se uh, economics, what are the economics of it? Well, there are two things in economics, trade. Good example being Central Asian trade is about 46% of Central Asian trade is with Russia. So there's a lot of economics there. For example, at the time of the breakup, Lithuania's trade with Russia was 92%. So it was very dependent. The Russians needed that kind of trade. Obviously, that trade has gone down, particularly in the Lithuanian case, because Lithuania is more pro-West now in terms of the EU, in terms of its NATO me membership. But trade is a very important factor. But within the economic section, 
the biggest issue is energy. And you have to look at the energy situation in Russia. Let's look at this. Russia right now is a big energy producer, oil and gas, one of the world's largest producers. Take a look at its domestic economy. 65% of its exports are based on energy, okay, on the commodities, oil and gas, which make up about 20% of GDP. It's a big part of their economy. And if you look at the oil and gas in terms of its exports, it's all mostly going westward into, into Eastern Europe and into Western Europe. And if you look at the numbers, they're staggering. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, I think, for example, Austria takes 74% of its gas from Russia. Italy about 25%, France 20 and Germany about 36%. Finland, I think, is like 100% takes its gas. So that kind of energy trade is very, very important to Russia. And why do I mention energy? It's not only the oil and gas that the Russians produce themselves within their own territory, but the surrounding areas of the former Soviet republics, particularly in the Caucasus and Central Asia, are large producers of oil and gas, particularly gas. Turkmenistan, for example, gas. Kazakhstan, oil and gas. Azerbaijan, huge producer of oil. So it's very important for the Russians to try to maintain some kind of influence over these areas in order to have access to that oil and gas, which continues to feed their economy, but more importantly, is a, pre is a leverage for pressure against those states and also possible economic pressure against the West in terms of the exports that they produce out there. And Ukraine becomes a special case, which I'll talk about later. Parallel to this issue of oil and gas production, is the issue of the pipelines. The pipelines pass through a lot of these territories and through Russian territory, so control of the pipelines, as I mentioned, would also influence the amount of political leverage Russia would have on neighboring states in terms of the energy flow of, the flow of uh, oil and gas through these pipelines to East, Eastern and Western Europe. Uh, the third issue of concern for the Russians is identity. Well, what do I mean by identity? It's very simple. There's a psychological issue or a philosophical issue that the Russians face at this stage. Soviet Union fell apart. During their heyday, the Soviets were a big world power. The United States and the Soviet Union were in a Cold War. Soviet Union falls apart. And the Russians feel their whole world fell apart. No one respects them. They have they can't identify, are they a regional power now? Are they still a world power? So for a lot of Russians, particularly the nationalists, there's a great desire to reconstitute the near abroad into some kind of new confederation, federation, whatever you want to call it, in order to be seen, to have Russia be seen as another great power, as it once was. So there's an identity problem for the Russians philosophically as to who they are in terms of the world role that they should or shouldn't play. Uh, identity goes a little bit further. Um, let's look at Russia a little bit more in terms of demographics here. Russia has about, what, 145, 150 million people. About 80% off the top of my head are ethnic Russians. But there's a great disparity taking place. The Russian birth rate is falling, ethnic birth rate, birth rate and the non-Russian one is rising, particularly among the Muslim populations in Russia. And by the year 2050, some people estimate that the non-Russian peoples in, the, in Russia would be a majority. So there's an identity problem for the Russians in the sense of who are they if the Muslim and non-Russian populations rise greatly and overtake the ethnic Russian population. And you say, well, what does this got to do with identity and near abroad? Very simple. One country they'll be coming to is Ukraine. A lot of Russians look to Ukraine, as they've stated throughout history, as their little brothers. You know, the, the great Russians and the little brothers, the, the, uh, the Ukrainians, brother Slavs. Ukraine with a population of 46 million people uh, is a big balancer in terms of reviving a Slavic uh, unity, a Slavic role in that part of the world. 
So you could imagine, you could do the math very simply. If Russia was able to take over Ukraine at one extreme or have a close relationship with Ukraine, 36 plus 145 immediately, you, uh, 46 plus 35, 145 adds the math up very quickly to almost 200 million people. You add a lot of Slavs into the mix. So the identity issue for the, for the Russians is their relationship with Ukraine historically is something that they would like to continue because it beefs up their numbers, it increases their role in the area, but also solidifies their identity. What I mean by identity a little bit more is those of you who have studied Russian history or Ukrainian history know full well that there's a split or there's an argument or discourse, depending how you want to look at it, between the Russians and the Ukrainians as to who came first. Kiev and Rus, Kiev, capital of Ukraine, is seen as the cradle for the development of Russian history, the Russian peoples, but the Ukrainians claim that that's where they developed. So whoever wins that argument means that the others don't even exist, basically. So this may be a moot academic point for a lot of people, but when it comes to the world of politics, the Russians need to claim that Kiev and Rus is theirs because that's their roots, that's their identity. But if the Ukrainians win that argument, then the Russians, what, where do they come from? So there's that issue of identity that takes place along, along these lines. So we've talk, spoke about security, energy, and we've spoken about identity issues here for the, for the uh, Russian interest. The last interest I wanted to point out is the interest uh, of regional politics. Central Asia is probably a good point right now. We spoke about NATO expansion, but the Russians are concerned about the role of Iran and China specifically in Central Asia. Iran, for example, is uh, extending its cultural influences by languages, assistance, its economic interests, uh, it's the second largest trader with Turkmenistan, for example, and the first one is China. The Chinese have opened a new gas pipeline, pipeline for Turkmenistan in late uh, December of 2009 to China. So with the Islamic um, insurgencies that's taking place, this creates even more concern for Russia. For example, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan has been fighting for years there to revive Islamic law in the states. And there's this whole Fergana Valley that runs from Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and uh, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, the issue is, of Turkmenistan, I mean, Turkmenistan, uh, where the Islamic rebels have been fighting in order to create a kind of an Islamic society. Now, there have been two types of uh, Islamic radicals. Uh, those who used warfare and those who believe that they could fight through peaceful means. I shouldn't say fight through peaceful means, but can get their objectives through peaceful means. And the fear is that Iranian influence among these Islamic elements will create problems for the region, give Iran more influence, which means that Iran would have influence over the energy sources, which means the Russians don't have the influence that would be necessary for them to maintain some, some kind of energy uh, benefits. So you get the picture there. There's a whole steamroller effect here or domino effect here. So there's this concern for the Russians for who's going to be supreme in that part of the world in terms of influence over these states that have Islamic roots and was Iran moving in very strongly into this region. Having said all this, given you the uh, outlines of the Russian concerns and all, the issue arises, what, what does Russia really want to accomplish here? What is their goal? Do they really want a confederation? Do they really want another Soviet Union? My argument would be, I don't think they can do it even if they wanted to. I think what the Russians are looking for is traditional influence, spheres of influence, but they really don't 
want to reconstitute any kind of union. And there are two reasons for that. Reason number one is they can't. If you look at the Russian situation right now, they're in bad straits. Their economy was down 8% last year. Okay? So their economy is down. Unemployment is like at 12%, so they're having a hard time. And those of you, obviously all of you follow this issue and have been reading the newspapers or watching the news, you've had demonstrations from Vladivostok to Kaliningrad against Putin, claiming that he's not meeting the economic objectives that the people want. You know, jobs, social progress, etc. So there's a lot of turmoil within Russia itself because the Russians can't meet their objectives. And while energy is a big source of income, and it's great to have the energy, it depends on world prices. Prices fall, the economy falls. That's been one of the problems that the Russian economy has been facing in the past few years. So the Russians themselves are not exactly in the best of shape to be able to project their power overseas into the near abroad. The other thing you have to carefully look at is that the near abroad to a great extent is a more of a drain, I would say, for Russia. Remember, during the Soviet period, the center basically supported a lot of the outlying republics, which are now independent states. These states cannot support themselves, and a lot of them can't govern themselves. That would be a big drain economically on Russia on trying to support these states. Okay? So, I don't think the Russians, if they look at it objectively, really want to go in and create another Soviet Union or another empire. What they would like to do is pick and choose and have some kind of influence in individual states or regions. But this would give them the luxury of both worlds. They would have the political leverage and benefits, but at the same time, they would not have the economic cost of having to maintain these individual countries. Okay? Now, we keep talking about the near abroad as some kind of cohesive single force. Um, before we move on, I would like to just point out, you could probably divide the near abroad into four categories very quickly, so you get an idea. Um, starting at the West, you have the, four, the Baltics. Very clearly, these states are lost forever, so to speak, to the Soviet Union, to, to Russia. The Baltics have become members of the EU, they've become members of NATO, while the Russians try to uh, exert some kind of influence, the chances of them being lured away are slim to none at this stage of the game. And what kind of influence do they try to exert? You've heard about the cyber warfare into Estonia, something that NATO is now trying to figure out how to fight back on. Um, you've heard about the Russians stopping oil flows at times to Lithuania. This has happened, probably will continue going on in order to try to disrupt uh, the Baltic states in terms of their relationship with NATO and to create all problems. But the chances of the Russians having any huge influence in these states is diminishing each year and has diminished considerably since these states have become members of NATO. All the way on the other side, if you go to toward the east, Central Asia, this, what are called the Stans, see if I get them all right here, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. I think I got them all. Okay, good. So the Stans, probably the weakest states among the former republics of, of, the, Soviet, of the old Soviet Union. These states are politically weak. They're based on single party kind of rule or, you know, uh, dictatorships. Uh, they're economically weak. Uh, a good example being Turkmenistan. For example, 45% of, I think, of Turkmenistan's economy is based on people migrating to Russia to work to send money back to the, home, to the homeland. Those are the kinds of economies that you have. Uh, and I mentioned to you already the problem with Islamic uh, militants in, uh, in, the, in the region. So this, the, this is probably the weakest link in terms of the near abroad 
in probably one of the areas that is very rich in terms of natural resources, uh, such as Kazakhstan with oil and, and um, Turkmenistan with gas, as I mentioned, and the Russians would like to have some kind of influence. But you can see from this perspective, this is not exactly a group of states that you would like to be enfolded into your domain that you're responsible for maintaining, protecting, etc. Okay, all right? The major uh, concern for Russia here, as I mentioned, is the fear of Iran and Islamic terrorism. And the greatest fear among those states is that in itself. And that's why they've welcomed U.S. participation with the U.S. Uh, military base or now the, the development of a counterterrorism base in Kyrgyzstan to fight the Islamic terrorists and as a transit point for our support in Afghanistan. The fear is that the Taliban would move into these states as we push them out of Afghanistan and then it would uh, create more problems for those states. So they've been cooperating with the United States in order to try to quash the rebellions in Afghanistan. But these states know full well that once the terrorism issue is resolved in Afghanistan that the United States will probably leave. The United States is not a long-term presence in this part of the world. It's, it is too isolated. I'll give you a good example. I spoke about the percentage of trade that uh, that part of the world has or those five republics have with Russia. I think I mentioned like 46 percent. Well, to give you a good comparison, only about three percent of their trade is with the United States. So that gives you a comparison of the power that the Russian economy is going to have, the proximity, that proximity gives the Russians that kind of power. For the United States, that kind of power is not going to be there. And so there's concern upon these states that once the issue of Afghanistan is resolved, the United States will leave. The other two groups that I would mention are in the Caucasus, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, very rich in natural resources in terms of oil. I mentioned Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan goes back many, many decades as an oil-rich place uh, that produced a lot of oil for World War II and before World War II. And the Ru Russians obviously would like to maintain some kind of influence in that part of the world. Uh, and you saw Georgia was very important because of the NATO attempt to incorporate Georgia into NATO and Georgia's movement toward NATO. The last grouping and probably the one where the focus is going to be is Moldova, Belarus, and Ukraine. Belarus is probably the closest allied with Russia at this stage of the game. They have what is known as the Eurasian Economic Community, which also includes Kazakhstan. Um, they've been talking about the customs union. They've been talking about a single monetary system, which hasn't come through. Uh, Lukashenko, who's been president there for years, has been talking about some kind of amalgamation of Belarus and Russia uh, and him holding some kind of position in a new government there, in a new state. None of that has ever come through. Uh, but they are probably the closest aligned in terms of ethnic identity, in terms of political philosophy, in terms of reliance than any other republic. Moldova is a little special because of the Transnistria issue, the small Russian enclave that's broken away. Uh, Russians have troops there, and that's not been resolved and as, isn't going to be resolved for a while uh, for a simple reason that the Russians like to maintain their 3,000 or so troops there in order to have some kind of influence in how Moldova shapes up. But more importantly, it's probably good for the Russians to maintain their troops there as a pressure point against Ukraine. Now, that's the big prize right there, Ukraine. What I'd like to do over the next few minutes is talk about Ukraine. I mentioned at the outset that uh, there was concern on the part of a lot of people in Ukraine as well as in the international community that in the wake of the elections in February of this year, with the victory of Viktor Yanukovych, that Ukraine would become very pro-Moscow. Let me give you a little background on all of this. Back in 2004, you probably recall the Orange Revolution that took place, one of the color revolutions that uh, 
took place throughout uh, that part of the world in Eastern Europe, orange being the symbol of the pro-Western, uh, pro-reform elements in, in Ukraine. Uh, at that time, the election uh, was won by Yanukovych, who had been a former prime minister in, in Ukraine. Um, the election was deemed fraudulent. Uh, Yanukovych was openly backed by the Russians. Uh, he had advocated kind of a pro-Russian line. Uh, the international outcry led to a new vote and Viktor Yushchenko won and heralded a, the, the um, beginning of a very pro-West, pro-reform type of government in Ukraine. The Orange Revolution had taken place. He took office in 2005, and everyone expected that Ukraine would become a linchpin of Western reform and a Western power in that part of the world. Well, what happened is that in the four or five years after Yushchenko's election, his constant bickering and fighting with Timoshenko, who was one of his supporters during the Orange Revolution, who became a prime minister off and on during his presidency, uh, kind of polarized the politics of Ukraine, uh, kind of stymied any kind of development. What happened was basically in four or five years, you had constant bickering and uh, infighting and no movement on the economic or reform front. Yushchenko did, however, make an open bid in January of two, 2008 for Ukrainian membership in NATO, a formal presentation uh, by the Prime Minister, the Speaker of the Ukrainian Rada Parliament, as well as by Yushchenko. And all three elements united, the Parliament, the President, the Prime Minister, and did a letter to NATO requesting NATO membership for Ukraine. Uh, and that was seen as a big move toward the West. Well, Bucharest, and I mentioned this earlier, the Bucharest uh, NATO conference uh, didn't actually move in that direction. Uh, NATO did not offer Ukraine the MAP program or the, the agenda for, that Ukraine needed to follow to become a member of NATO. What happened was that uh, there was a lot of opposition on the part of Germany, France, Spain, some other states against uh, membership for uh, Ukraine as well as Georgia, but particularly Ukraine at this stage for Ukrainian membership in NATO. There was concern that without resolving two issues, that bringing Ukraine into NATO would become more of a problem for NATO than a benefit to NATO or to Ukraine. And those two issues basically were, there were a lot of unresolved issues between Europe and Russia that had to be taken care of. And also within Ukraine, the reform movement hadn't taken place along the lines that a lot of people had anticipated. What do I mean by the issues between uh, Europe and Russia? Well, the issues were simple, energy. Anytime the Russians and Ukrainians got into an argument, the Russians would turn off the spigot, and I'm simplifying this for the, just to illustrate purposes, would turn off the spigot, stopping the flow of gas into Ukraine, and the Ukrainians would kind of turn off the spigot, which would mean they would stop the flow into Western Europe, which meant everywhere got cold during the winters. And it always turned out that sometime, that this would always be like in January or February that the, that the gas wars would start, as they say, in that part of the world. And Ukraine is important for this because the transit lines for Russian gas to Western Europe go through Ukraine, okay? So anytime Ukraine and Russia get into a, po into a problem, the Western Europeans can pay a price in terms of the energy flow into their, into their countries because the transit lines go through Ukraine. So you had this situation that has to be resolved. You also had issues of the conventional forces agreement, uh, other issues that get very arcane that uh, Europeans want to resolve. But the Europeans, the Germans and the French in particular said, you can't have Ukraine and NATO if you have this problem with Russia. We need to solve the problems with Russia first and understanding with Russia on various issues before we can open the door to Ukraine. And domestically, Ukraine has to reform. Corruption is very high. 
The rule of law really is almost non-existent in terms of business dealings. You can come in, sign a deal with one minister today, that minister gets replaced the next week and he claims or she claims, well, your agreement was my, with my predecessor, now that predecessor is no longer here, I'm in charge, we need to renegotiate. And that's the kind of problems you face. And so it's very difficult to do business. So, what happened, it gives you the background now, what's going on. In um, this past election, Yushchenko came in with less than 5% of the vote. Uh, no one got uh, the necessary 50% plus one vote in the first round. Uh, the two leading contenders, Yanukovych and Timoshenko, the prime minister, were in a runoff. Uh, Yanukovych won, and Yanukovych won with three and a half percent of the vote difference. So an even split, uh, an even split. And so Yanukovych is now the president and this concern that he would move Ukraine toward Moscow. He had been backed by Moscow in the first election five years ago. Uh, he had spoken favorably about Russia during this campaign. And so now there was internal concern as well as external concern. I'm sure you saw a lot of stories in the press. Will Ukraine move toward Moscow? Will Ukraine become under the shadow of Russia, et cetera? I would say, just as I said at the outset, nothing's black or white, there are shades of gray, and this situation also. I would be very careful about saying that Ukraine is going to be moving toward Moscow or that Ukraine is going to be overtaken by Russia. I would say, Three things. You have to look at what Yanukovych, his, what his actions have been in the past, what he has said, and also some of the realities here that Ukraine is dealing with. Uh, if you look at uh, his past performance, he was prime minister, I think, on two occasions, like 2002 to 2004, then uh, 2006 to 7 or something like that. I forget the exact dates. Uh, and he did a fairly decent job. People give him credit for stabilizing the economy as best as you can stabilize an economy, the type that Ukraine was. Uh, and he didn't do anything greatly overt to move Ukraine or try to move Ukraine toward Russia. Okay? The other thing is, if you look at, so his track record hasn't been, in terms of things that he's done, his track record hasn't indicated that he's strongly moving Ukraine toward Russia. If you look at what he's been saying, if you look during the campaign, during the presidential campaign, Timoshenko slowed down her rhetoric also. She's very pro-reform, pro-West, nationalistic to a great extent. But she toned down her rhetoric. Even in the wake of Russia's invasion of uh, Georgia, the war with Georgia, she toned down her rhetoric. Unlike Yushchenko, who was very anti-Russian, uh, in his rhetoric in, in the war. She, she did this, toned it down, for political reasons during the campaign. She had a need to win the vote in eastern Ukraine, in, which is mostly pro-Russian, in order to, get, to win the presidency. She, it, that strategy did not succeed. So what I'm positing to you is that Yanukovych also had to say a number of things during the campaign in order to get a lot of votes that were pro-Russian, but he also had to tone down some stuff to get votes from Western Ukraine. We'll to return to some of this a little later on. And why do, why do I say this? Uh, during, the ca during the campaign, Yanukovych spoke about the need for giving the Russian language more precedence, okay? Giving the Russian language a greater weight in Ukraine. His platform, as a matter of fact, speaks about two state languages, two languages in Ukraine, obviously Ukrainian and Russian. But just the other day, he was at the gravesite of the great national poet of Ukraine, Taras Shevchenko, from the 19th century, laying a wreath, which is done every year by the president of Ukraine. And he spoke about giving Ukraine making Ukrainian or maintaining Ukrainian as the state language and that Russian would be only recognized under the charter of the languages that was signed by the Council of Europe in, U 
a few years ago and that Ukraine is a signatory, signatory of. In fact, I forget the exact title of that, of that uh, agreement. But under this Council of Europe agreement, states can give some kind of precedence or recognition to languages within, their re within particular regions. So for example, what Yanukovych now is saying is that Ukrainian will remain the state language of Ukraine, but Russian can be used in regions where 20% or more of the people utilize that language. In other words, Eastern Ukraine, which is mostly pro-Russian uh, pro and heavily ethnic Russian, can use U uh, Russian languages in their internal matters. But in the state language, the state language is going to be Ukrainian. Kind of a difference from what the uh, campaign platform said, and quite different from what a lot of people have been reporting. So he already he's starting to move toward the center, so to speak. Keep the Russians placated, but at the same time, keep the Ukrainians placated, uh, the Ukrainian ethnic groups and the nationalists in Western Ukraine placated. So keep the Russians happy by giving Russian recognition on a local level, but keeping the Ukrainian nationalists and Western Ukrainians happy by keeping Ukrainian the state language. So you gotta look at what the, what is actually taking place now. The, the other things I would uh, point out is there was a lot of speculation that as soon as uh, Yanukovych was elected, he would get on a plane, go up to Moscow and start taking orders from Putin as to what he should be doing. Well, actually what he did is he got on a plane and he went west to Brussels. That was his first trip, he went to Brussels. He went to the EU. He made it quite clear that Ukraine's future in terms of economic development and progress, et cetera, lies with the European Union, all right? Ukraine has to develop with its relationship with the West. And he made three telling remarks during his visit to Brussels. Number one, he said that Ukraine wants to be integrated with the West. Number two, you, Ukraine needs to have stable relations with Russia, but his first thing was the, the West. And thirdly, that, the United, that Ukraine wants to maintain good and open and friendly relations, particularly with the United States. Okay, so he said all the right things. And if you look at what he's saying, he's moving Ukraine into a neutral kind of stance. As a matter of fact, he said his goal is to have Ukraine not join any military bloc, so obviously he's still anti-NATO anti, uh, membership for Ukraine, but at the same time, he's not exactly running to the, Ru the Russian uh, Collective Security uh, Treaty. So we'd like to maintain it as non block aligned, so to speak, and he spoke about and used the term neutrality. Ukraine should remain neutral in this kind of situation. So if you look at his past performance and you look at uh, his rhetoric, he's not exactly moving toward Moscow at this stage of the game, at least. And there's another th feature that's gonna strongly affect his policies. He got a lot of criticism that the oligarchs in Ukraine are supporting him or supported him during the presidential election. And yes, they did support him. <coughs> But these oligarchs, if you look at them, know that their economic future lies with Europe. Yes, they were able to garner a lot of uh, real estate, a lot of financial resources, and took a good control of the Ukrainian economy. But they also know that in order to grow economically and to increase their holdings, they have to have a relationship with the West where the relationship is more or less among equals and is business-like than with Russia, where they could be a little bit dicey in terms of the relationship that you have. So the oligarchs in Ukraine themselves are looking toward moving toward the, the West, and they are some of the largest supporters of Yanukovych. So if you, don't, if you have doubts about Yanukovych, you might want to look at uh, the oligarchs and what they are advocating at this stage of the game as well. Uh, the last thing I would point to, that's not to say that Yanukovych, let me just be clear, it's not to say Yanukovych is totally oblivious to the relationship with Russia. He needs a close relationship with Russia. Let's look at some of those, uh, some of those realities. 
first of all. The first reality, and one that we, I, I've, I've addressed already, is energy. He has to resolve the energy situation with Russia. Why? Because Ukraine gets about 80% of its oil and gas from Russia. It's very simple. It depends on, on Russia for its energy. Ukraine has been lax in terms of developing its own energy resources. As a matter of fact, um, a few years ago, they opened the Black Sea for the first tender ever for uh, deep sea drilling in uh, the Black Sea for oil and hydrocarbons. And uh, there's a feeling that the resources, natural, uh, the hydrocarbons in the Black Sea are so vast that Ukraine could possibly solve a lot of its energy needs. The problem is Ukrainians haven't been able to get their acts together with the Western company that won that tender in order to get the drilling started. So like three or four years after the tender was granted, they're all locked up in litigation still at The Hague as to whether or not this uh, company has the right to drill or not. The company, by the way, is Vanco, it's Houston based. For transparency's sake, I was an advisor to Vanco to help them get that uh, tender in Ukraine. But uh, Vanco has not been able to overcome the legal problems or legal challenges in Ukraine. Just to give you an idea of some of the problems they have is that after Vanco won the tender offer, Timoshenko, who was a pro-West prime minister, argued that the tender should go to a domestic company or to a nationally rec or an internationally recognized oil company, not to a small oil company. And so she pulled back the agreements, and that's when Vanco took it to The Hague for arbitration. This goes to the whole issue of no legal rules. You could change the rules at almost any time in Ukraine. This is one of the problems that they've been having. But anyway, the energy issue is something that Ukraine needs to resolve. Yanukovych knows that, so he can't pull the plug totally on the relationship with Russia. He has to have a stable relationship with Russia to solve the energy thing, issue. And one of the things he's been advocating is some kind of energy consortium for the European states and for Ukraine to be involved in. Something to solve the energy issue in terms of pricing for Ukraine, in terms of the supplies that would come into Ukraine. All right? Uh, the other issue that's going to need to be resolved, are we running out of time? Oh, we are. Oh, okay. I talk too much, I guess. Uh, the other issue is the Black Sea Fleet. The agreement for the basing of the Black Sea Fleet in Crimea expires in 2017. The Russians are building a new port for the fleet but the Russians would like to maintain that presence for obvious reasons to have some influence in Crimea. Yanukovych has said he probably would favor extending that. And the only reason I could see him thinking of extending that is not only the leasing of uh, uh, the fleet, uh, the port because of the money that it brings in, but also the issue of keeping the st a relationship stable with Russia. Why rock the boat so much? Uh, the fleet itself, he may feel, is not a threat to Ukraine's existence. Uh, it may be a, a mark against its, so to speak, flexibility of independence, or so to speak. But he does not want to rock the boat that much. He wants stability. And what do I mean by stability? Stability is very important. The overall relationship for Yanukovych, who had been prime minister and had kept inflation down, I think he probably understands the economy very well because he could be considered kind of an administrator more than a politician. Uh, not a very charismatic guy, by the way, also. So he's more of an administrator. So he understands the need for stability for, for Ukraine in order to be able to economically develop. And if you, those of you who have studied this issue may remember that in 1991, when Ukraine declared independence, they had a referendum. And 91% of the people voted for independence, including the ethnic Russians uh, in eastern Ukraine and in Crimea. And by the way, the majority of people in Crimea are ethnic Russians. They all voted for independence. Why? Because they felt Ukraine had a better economic future than Russia. 
Okay? Very simple. And during the campaign for the presidency, the issue wasn't NATO, the issue wasn't even Russia. You know what the majority of the polls indicated what the issue was? It was economics. The people in Ukraine wanted economic development. I think one poll showed like 70% of the people said that the economy was the most important issue in terms of their view of the future for the country. The economy had to be straightened out. So with stability comes an opportunity to develop economically. And I think what uh, Yanukovych wants to do, unlike, uh, I'm sure Yushchenko wants the stability also, but Yanukovych realizes, is, realizes that you need to keep a good relationship with Russia in order for that stability to maintain itself. What Yushchenko had been doing was becoming too nationalistic and pushing too hard uh, toward the West, offending Russia at the same time. Yanukovych realizes the need to balance the West and the, and the East, namely you know, the European Union and the United States and Russia, and kind of stay in the middle right now in order to give Ukraine time to develop. I hope that's a strategy. Uh, I hope it's a strategy that works. Uh, otherwise, Ukraine's going to have much of a problem. The, those of you who have been following the issue know full well, as the election indicated, there was an even split. Ukraine historically has been kind of two sides. The western part has been uh, pro-West and nationalistic. The eastern part has been kind of uh, ethnic Russian mostly, as well as Crimea and pro-Russia. And, pro, uh, uh, Russia. and with 17% of the population in current Ukraine uh, being ethnic Russians, there's a big base of people that the uh, regime needs, to, feels it needs to be placated or taken care of in order not to rock the boat. And I'll just give you one, two quick anecdotes from my experiences in Ukraine, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, when I was ambassador in Ukraine in the early 90s, one of the common uh, sayings throughout the country was, uh, and this was put out by Russians mostly to a extent, was that Ukraine wouldn't last as a country. Five years max, and it'll be gone. It'll be back with Russia. Well, almost 20 years later, it's still a country, okay? And it's existing. Uh, so I think a lot of the credit to Ukraine is not what it hasn't achieved. It hasn't achieved, it's what hasn't happened to it, you know? It hasn't fallen apart totally. And so it takes time to build a country. Uh, another uh, thing that's apropos of what I was talking about, uh, Eastern Ukraine, is during the time I served as ambassador and I dealt with President Kravchuk, the first the, uh, president of, of Ukraine, and I always spoke to him about economic reform and Ukrainians would always talk about postupovo, which basically means step by step. We have to do things step by step. And I remember talking once with the head of the SBU, which is the equivalent of, uh, you know, the secret police, you know, in Ukraine. And they talked about the need to do everything in a moderate form. Don't pu push privatization too much. Don't do economic reform too quickly. And the reason for that was they have a large base of ethnic Russians in eastern Ukraine. And if you privatize too quickly, you would create too many dislocations. And dislocations meant people would be unemployed. There'd be social turmoil. And if that happened in eastern Ukraine, then that would give a pretext for the Russians to get involved. And that would create political problems. So every time people criticize Ukraine for not moving too quickly on things like that, I remember these discussions that I had with the Ukrainian leadership at the time, how they try to balance everything. Um, another key point I think I would like to make here is Kuchma, who was the second president of Ukraine, when he was prime minister, one of the first meetings he had was with me as the ambassador. And I remember my first meeting with him. I went in, sat down with him, and we spoke. And we, again, of course, as the US ambassador, I started speaking about economic reform, et cetera, et cetera. And he sat there and he said, don't lecture me about economic reform, Pane Romane. He goes, don't lecture me about, they, they have a tendency to call you by your first name, Mr. Roman, Mr. John, that kind. And, uh, and he said in a friendly way, we had an open discussion. He says, I've been a communist all my life. I have the order of Lenin. You know, I've achieved this, I've done this. And 
I'll tell you something. I said, well, what are you going to tell me, Prime Minister? He says, I'll tell you, communism does not work. I said, mm. OK, good. That's good. However, we know we need to move forward. We know we need to move forward. The problem, though, Pane Roman, is we don't know what moving forward means. We have no idea. And that's probably true of all the fo former Soviet republics. Remember, these guys have been in so indoctrinated with the Marxist economic philosophy that they know it doesn't work, but they haven't been exposed to anything else in terms of what's out there. You know, how does it really operate? How do you put this stuff together? And I'll leave you with one last uh, story. I'm sorry, Alan. Uh, this is an apocryphal story, but I think it kind of sheds light on all this. President Kravchuk sitting in his office uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning uh, when he was, uh, and he relayed this story, supposedly it's an apocryphal story, but uh, he relayed, so when he was head of the party, he would be sitting in his office, the phone would ring at 9 o'clock in the morning, he'd pick up the phone, yes, 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 it was Moscow calling, yes, yes. Five minutes later, he'd hang up the phone, he turned to the other side of the desk, pick up the phone, bark the orders for the day into the phone, put the phone down. At 9, 10, his day was over. He sat. He says, you know what the problem now is? That phone from Moscow doesn't ring anymore. So that's it. Okay, thank you very much, folks. I guess we have time for questions. Before questions, I just here. I just wanted to um, introduce Gleek Whitney, who um, was detained in traffic from the Howenstein Center. He wasn't acknowledged earlier, but he is here now. So he's one of our sponsors for the evening. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your comments and insights. Uh, I have a comment with regard to the uh, reasons why. Russia may not be interested in the Central Asian states becoming part of mm -hmm. the greater Russian Empire mm -hmm. nation. And that again has to do with the extremely high birth rate mm -hmm. um, that is sure. due to the negative birth rate mm -hmm. in Russia. The question that I have, what do you know about the missile defense system mm -hmm. that Russia is placing into the Baltic? Uh, what is its purpose and what is its, is its extent? Uh, well, I don't think they're placing anything into the Baltics, but uh, are you talking about the U.S. thing in Poland and the Czech Republic no. or the Russian? The Russian. Russian. Uh, I don't know much about it other than uh, it was seen as a counterfoil to the U.S. efforts to place missiles in uh, Poland and into the Czech Republic, which was, and there were two stages to that. Uh, under President George W. Bush, uh, there were attempts to put the missiles there, and then under President Obama, it was scaled down a little bit. So at this stage, I don't know if the Russians are going to be scaling down their, their efforts on this. Yes, go ahead. What they were doing this winter, um, which actually were spoiled by the ice in the Baltic right. Sea. Uh, and I guess my interest is, I come from that region. I. Uh, I think it was probably tied to the original President Bush effort. Uh, there's also, as you know, the uh, START, nego uh, START negotiations because the START treaty expired at the end of last year and we're close to uh, getting a new treaty which would reduce, I think, missiles by about 25% or so. Uh, but we're tied up on issues of verification. I think all that is probably part of the jockeying. I can't, I can't see that kind of missile defense being, a, being a, of any threat to the United States from that, because that would have been yeah, short range. Yeah. That's, well, but, but any, any kind of deployment of missiles like that would be a, fit into the pattern of trying to put their power to, you know, threat, not threaten, but to show there's a, there's a line for the Russians. I think part of the issue goes back to what I had said earlier by comments is the Russians are still in the flux as to who they are in terms of a power. 
Uh, are they a regional power? Are they a rural power? And I think that goes into, that probably falls into that line. Those are two questions in there, okay? And two very good questions. Let me take the second one first. There's been a long debate, particularly in the early part of the um, demise of the Soviet Union. The issue, the question was whether or not Russia would influence the near abroad or the near abroad would influence Russia. We put our eggs in a basket saying that if you promoted economic and democratic reform in Russia, that would do two things. It would take away the Russian drive for empire because they're de Democrats. And at the same time, by taking that drive away from the Russians, it would influence the development of democracy and economic reforms in Ukraine, Belarus, Latvia, you know, the other repu well, republics, okay? On paper, a very legitimate uh, theory in practicality didn't work that way. Uh, the other point of view during that time was that you can't just back Russia. You had to make a concerted effort to support Ukraine uh, and the other near abroad republics for the simple reason that by supporting Russia, if that policy failed, then you had two things. You had a strong Russia and a weak periphery. But if you supported Ukraine uh, more than we did, you know, actually, I'm speaking here, everything's relative, and if you supported some of the other republics, but here particularly talking about Ukraine, then if you had a Russia that didn't go democratic or didn't go, you know, wasn't a positive actor on the world stage, you had a strong Ukraine that would act as a buffer. All right, so that's, yes, there's always that debate that's taking place among policymakers and among academics as to whether, how you balance Ukraine and Russia. Do you support Russia and hope it trickles down or do you support Ukraine and you hope it trickles up type of thing. Uh, in terms of uh, the democratic institutions in Ukraine, uh, I would say two things. Uh, Ukraine is a, political structure in flux. It's based more on individuals and personalities than on party structures, okay? In Ukraine, you speak, you don't speak of the party, you speak of the blocks, you know, the Timoshenko block, you know? And early on, when I was there in the early 90s, it was clubs, you know, the Drac Club, who was a, a poet and a political activist, this guy's club, that guy. So it was kind of personality-based, uh, no strong uh, political parties or political culture. They don't have a political culture yet. But having said that, they have had a number of presidential elections. They've had four presidents, Kravchuk, Kuchma, uh, Yushchenko, and Yanukovych, all without resorting to any kind of street violence. Um, in the wake of the Orange Revolution, uh, I think it codified the importance uh, of elections and the acceptance of the electoral process by the populace as a legitimate vehicle in which to participate and by which to make change. And I think that was solidified with this election. Uh, also, you had a very strong media emerge from the Orange Revolution. So the media is much freer in Ukraine than in Russia. So I think the rudiments of a political culture are starting to develop very nicely in Ukraine. Thank you for coming mm -hmm. on the show. Uh, you mentioned that um, Russia sees Iran as one of the threats. Um, lately you have been following up the news and stuff, and I see that they have pretty healthy uh, relationships, diplomatic relationships. Um, Amelina Jao joined the Russian mm -hmm. yeah. Going on too. Yep. So I would like to know the basis of your comment and your perspective. Sure. 
Sure, the basis, the, the basis of my comment is not uh, the uh, Russian-Iranian conflict. There's no conflict as such. You're right to point out uh, Russia is a very strong supporter of Iran, particularly when it comes to the nuclear issues, the atomic energy issues there. Uh, Russia has been reluctant in terms of supporting the U.S. position when it comes to sanctions in Iran at the uh, U.N. Security Council, all very legitimate. Uh, my, my point that I was making is in terms of Central Asia, the jockeying that takes place uh, in terms of who will influence that region and in which direction it will go. You know, states can have good relations in one domain, but can have bad relations in another. For Russia, the concern in Central Asia is the Islamic movement. If it spreads, and it spreads into, uh, into Russia proper, uh, and uh, at the same time, if uh, it spreads and Iran has an influence over it, the energy sources, oil and gas, particularly in Turkmenistan, the gas because of bordering on Afghanistan and all, that's a big concern. There's also talk, uh, well, of a Farsi alliance. Now, each of those languages is kind of related, but it's not exactly Farsi, of a Farsi alliance of what, uh, you know, like Tajikistan, uh, Turkmenistan, and northern Afghanistan, uh, led by Iran. So all those kinds of things would undermine Russia's influence in terms of the energy axis there. But uh, I don't see a, that's the concern that the Russians have in Central Asia, but I don't see a discrepancy of dealing with Iran positively on one and not on another. That, that's, that's normal in international relations. I'm not saying it's good, but it seems to be normal. One last question. Last question. Yes. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, because the... Uh, oh, there you are. Okay. Because the rain, uh, Ukraine has uh, divided the east and west, essentially, what is the language that the educational system is using uh, for development of their uh, workforce? It's, U it, it's Ukrainian now. Ukrainian now? Yes, yes. Okay. Secondly, uh, relative to the uh, economy in Ukraine, it was my understanding that predominantly agriculture uh, is that developed now to the point where uh, we integrate the, uh, the industrial society? Oh, it, it is an industrial society. I can't give you percentages, but it's not an agricultural society at all. If you look back to the Soviet period, uh, Eastern Ukraine, particularly the area around Kharkiv, and Kharkiv itself was the center of the aerospace industry, highly developed. Iron, uh, steel industry is a very major export item for Ukraine. As a matter of fact, Ukraine's economy has suffered uh, over the past few years because uh, the need for steel worldwide because the recession has declined, so Ukraine can't, there's no demand for Ukrainian steel. Very huge steel industries. No, absolutely, they're an industrial society. Uh, they're not, uh, you know, they're not uh, agriculturalists in the sense that uh, we would think that they're an agricultural society. Highly developed. Uh, they, ha they do have uh, the best soil probably in the world, I would say. The Chernozem, which is about 60% of Ukraine's uh, territory, it's uh, black earth, very productive. I mean, it's, I've been to the regions of the Chernozem, and you dig into that soil and you can't even find a pebble. You know, it's just pure black earth, rich. The problem they have in terms of agri when it comes to agriculture in this case is drought. You can have great soil, but you don't have rain. And that's the problem they have. They have droughts quite a bit. They are, agriculture produces wheat, uh, sunflower seed, very big items, but they are an industrial. industrial. They, uh, they also manufacture armaments and stuff, so they, uh, they are very industrial. Yeah. Ellen, okay, thank you very much. <laughs>